I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. we're going to do this, and he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network. I have one of my heroes on the podcast with me today, Matt Barry. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Matt, I don't think you even realize why you're one of my heroes. So for A, I just want to explain to the audience, um, you're the founder and CEO of Freelancer.com. And mm -hmm. in 2006, one of the companies that you have since acquired, uh, I outsourced the development of a website for just a few thousand dollars, which I ended up selling for a huge amount just eight months later. So... I just love the whole impact that freelancer.com is having on the entrepreneurial economy. Oh, that's phenomenal. I mean, it's, uh, that, uh, it's uh, I'm, I'm a success great. story for you. <laughs> that's great. I mean, what's really exciting about running a marketplace like ours, so for, for the listeners that are out there, I mean, basically we're, we're eBay for jobs. We have 15 million users from around the world. In fact, we just hit that milestone two weeks ago who have posted 7.5 million jobs. And the sorts of jobs that can be done on our site is really anything with a computer. So jobs like website design, that James, James had a website built, for example, uh, graphic design, uh, translation, copywriting, and so forth. About, you know, about five or six years ago, we had about 20 different categories of jobs. Now we have 750. So we have areas like aerospace engineering, genetic engineering, biotechnology, manufacturing, you name it. So really any sort of job that can be done with a computer. So, so, um, so Matt, let me ask you about that. What kind of... Air, what, the, what, what does an aerospace engineer do on freelancer.com? How does he become a freelancer? Um, well, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing, actually. You, you kind of think, well, who? You know, our, our, our employers are primarily small businesses, consumers from Western economies, so the US, UK, Canada, Australia. The freelancers are primarily from emerging economies, so India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Philippines. So you think to yourself, how is it possible that someone from an emerging economy is, is working in the aerospace industry? And then you look at the Indian, Indian aerospace industry, and it's huge. It's much bigger than Australia's, for example. So... Um, you know, the, the sorts of jobs I've seen go through there, and every year it does blow me away in terms of the complexity and the sophistication of the jobs. They're really – every year it gets better and better and better. But I've, I've seen things like computational fluid dynamics over, a, over, a, over an aerospace body. I've seen a um, – I think it was a California electric car company get a drivetrain assembly designed through our site. I mean, you do see all sorts of crazy things because, you see, in the developing world um, – they're just like you or I. So, you know, give an opportunity in education, um, just as smart. Only, only I kind of call them PhDs. Poor, hungry, driven. They they work harder. They, they work. They they have a much better work ethic than, than I think many of many of my compatriots in, in in Australia, for example. And and you know, you know, the internet now is really proliferating knowledge in in, in such an amazing way. Um, where you know, if you have an internet connection, a computer, really, you can just go online. And if you want to, you know, learn how to do 
you know, uh, learn, learn a subject in aerospace engineering. I mean, MIT and Harvard and Stanford and all the big universities around the world, they've had their course material online for, you know, well over a decade or so. And now you've got like this revolution in, in with the Udacity and Coursera and all these online universities where you have, you know, more sophisticated courses being provided in, in really any subject area you, 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 you want. So, so, you know, people who have an education can jump in and work in a skilled area, but if, if you don't, you can screw yourself up thanks to the internet. Yeah, so for instance, um, as an example, let's say someone is feeling stuck and tired in their in their job, wants to work from home, maybe they want to um, be around their kids more or whatever, uh, they could uh, use a, something like Code Academy or Lynda.com to learn WordPress skills, and then suddenly, you know, they can list their skills on Freelancer.com and they could bid for jobs and start making a living. That's right. I mean, it's a fantastic platform, not just to turn your ideas into reality. If you're an entrepreneur and you have an idea for a website like you did to kind of get them, get them done really cost effectively and, and, and quickly. But, but also if, if you are a, a freelancer and, and you want to, or you're, a, you're, you're in a certain career and you want to change career or you have a, a hobby or a passion or an interest in, 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 in doing something new, it, it allows you to really architect your career. Um, so maybe for a few weeks you learn about web design and you work on a few websites, then you maybe want to learn about you know, mobile phone app development. You can do that for a few weeks and then maybe you want to learn about music or some, something, something completely new, wearable computing or maybe how to, how to program for the Apple, Apple Watch that's now come out. It, it really allows you to kind of architect your career. And, so, and it, doesn't matter where, it doesn't matter where you are. You might be in a remote community or a regional community and you can kind of work in, in, in these areas, which, is, which is, I think is really special. Right. And the, and the flip side of that is, let's say I'm an entrepreneur and I come up with an idea for an app for the Apple Watch. I can then go to yeah. freelancer.com. I can put out the spec of my idea. I, I'm not, if I'm outsourcing to you know, one of these third world countries, I'm not really worried about anybody stealing my idea. Uh, I, I get the app built and upload to the Apple Store and I'm in business. I mean, that's, it's basically as simple as that. I mean, really, you're only limited by your imagination now. If you have that spark of an idea, that spark of creativity in terms of starting a business or starting a developing a product or a service or whatever it may be, we take the time, the cost, and the hassle out of turning that idea into reality by connecting you with an online workforce. I mean, to get like an app built, for example, I think the average price for like an Apple uh, iPhone app at the moment is around $650. So it really is quite inexpensive and quite low cost to kind of really get – you know, get these things done. I don't think most people realize that. I think mo- like I think a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to have to spend twenty thousand dollars for an app. Uh, but like, I- I'll just tell you the example. Like, so when I started this this website in in 2006, first I wanted some designs, and so for a couple hundred dollars, they they de- I spec'd out the site and they designed every uh, p- page of the site, and then I said, okay, implement it now, code it, and that cost me two thousand dollars to code the first version of the site. And then altogether, maybe I spent less than like eight thousand dollars for a site that had millions of users. Ultimately, yeah. And you, so, you, you you mentioned in your blog, so you have a blog, nothing venture, nothing gain. You, you haven't written on it in a while, but you mentioned uh, one example where you saw an online store. Uh, I think it was selling like um, paints or whatever, and you decided yeah. to just completely duplicate the store, and then also hire a freelancer to get you high on SEO. And then you started making like on average three hundred dollars a day in sales. So this is yeah. So this is a long time ago. Uh, this is when I was. Um, this is this is when I sort of really discovered the whole industry. Before I started freelance.com, I was using some of the small sites that are out there in the space. And and I had I had this I had this concept in my head of you know in the future could there possibly be companies that could exist that actually don't have any staff where you've got a business model which works so well that. You know, really, it's just automated. It's all run by software, and you can just generate revenue without actually having to employ anyone. So, you know, I had this little bit of an idea. I found I found this website that did um, a wholesaling of, of sort of art and craft supplies, and um, I basically just mirror, you know, hired some freelancers to mirror that website, uh, but just mark everything up in terms of a retail price. And then um, I used that retail every time an order was placed on the retail website. I basically uh, sent an order off to the wholesale website who just drop ship it for me. And then I had a, hired a freelancer for about $350 a month to do customer service and just kind of deal with customer queries and update the site and keep it running and so forth. And in fact, uh, it, so I wasn't making a lot of money, but the, but the, but the model kind of worked. And um, in could, fact, could, could you have extended that like to basically do a thousand stores? No, oh, I, I think I think I think I probably could have extended. In, I, don't, I don't know about a thousand stores, but I certainly could have ex- extended that model uh, uh, significantly further. Um, but you know, in fact, I mean that site was, that, that was kind of running for so long. I actually forgot the, the the password to the PayPal account 
and a few years later, I got logged in and kind of, oh, there's a little bit of money there. And I mean, obviously, over time, that that you know, I didn't put any investment at the time or energy into that business, so it, it did it did eventually kind of you know, you know dwindle away. But so it was kind of it was an interesting little sort of concept um, for kind of what you, what you can do um, using freelancers. Yeah. So so who's who right now would you say is making money, making a living? Even by Western standards, on freelancer.com, like what kind of skill set? How, how do I? Let's say I'm sitting in my cubicle and I'm stuck. And how do I now? Um, let's say I have some skills, or I, or I take some courses and take some skill, get some skills. Yeah. How do I become a freelancer and start making a living? Well, I mean, the beauty about the site is everyone on the site is there to make money. So whether you're an employer, being primarily small business owners and startups and so forth, in the in Western economies or freelancers in developing world economies, you're there to make money. So if you're in the US, for example, you're probably setting up a website to do something. I mean, you sell products online or, or um, you know, um, come up with a blog with, you know, with some sort of model, maybe a membership model or whatever it may be. If you're a freelancer, you're there building a services business. So everyone is really there to make money. And, you know, so that's what's great is everyone's kind of you, – you're dealing with a network of really entrepreneurs where on both sides you, you've got – you're empowering entrepreneurs. In, in the West, you're empowering entrepreneurs to help get things done with the workforce. On the other side, you're empowering entrepreneurs in developing, developing economies with jobs and opportunity and income where it just doesn't exist. If you're in Bangladesh and you want to work in, say, SEO, for example, the jobs are very few and far between and they pay very much. Um, like, it, 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 you know – I really, if you're if you're in the U.S., for example, really where I encourage you to how, how to use the site is to start a business. I mean, everyone's got ideas on how, how on, on on you know something that they kind of would love to do um, in, in terms of running their own business, and we we really make it easy to kind of do that, right? So, but, but do you, do you think also there's a, a trend towards insourcing in the sense that if I'm in the U.S., I still might hire somebody in the U.S. and pay the higher prices just because it's easier to communicate and. Uh, uh, you know, I understand exactly what kind of work ethic I'm getting, and I can do due diligence and so on. Well, I think I think I think there are good reasons to to actually hire locally uh, and and hire, have employees. I, I don't think it's really the reasons are really around communication or around the the work ethic because I think you'll actually find that the free answers from emerging economies actually the work ethic is way way beyond what you'd actually get from a local provider. I mean, mm. people are making their month salary in a few hours or a few days, so they're really just interested in, you know, unlimited, you know, whatever it takes to keep you happy, unlimited revisions, et cetera, and so forth. I think the, I think the key reasons to hire um, and employ people directly is if you really have something that's core to your business, like really, like core intellectual property. Like if you're a, if you're a software company, for example, and you've got some, you know, some core algorithms or some core infrastructure, you know, it might make sense in, 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 you know, that you need to have that, those staff locally to kind of get the business done. But there's a lot of things that don't need to be core. And there's a lot of things that get done a lot better if you actually outsource them. So, for example, if you if you kind of want to get you know, a whole bunch of you know, graphic design done for flyers or for brochures or you want to get you know, some internet marketing done or you want to get translation done, I mean, these sort of jobs, it's, it's much, much better to kind of just use the freelance model than, than to actually try and hire someone locally and, and you know, employ them full time. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. I, I uh, recently uh, took a, a best-selling book, a book that's on the on the bestseller list, and I used freelancer.com to basically hire someone to rewrite the book, but uh, keep it exactly the same, but just change every word and move the sentences around a little so it's not plagiarism. And so I have the exact – and then I used freelancer.com to design a cover, and I used Facebook to A-B test – uh, different covers that I got off of freelancer.com and the whole thing cost me about uh, $3,000. I haven't yet released the book but it's it's ready to go. Oh, it's just so easy. I mean, I saw, I saw another book that went through a few, a few weeks ago. This is pretty crazy. So we've got two different ways you can get work done on the site. The main way that jobs get done uh, is by posting a project, which is the traditional outsourcing model. So you, you, you type a short description of what you want done, you set a budget, you hit post, and people from around the world bid on it, and you can ask them questions and kind of you know, pick who you want to, want to, want to hire and, and ultimately award them the job. And, but we have, a, we have another model in which you can get jobs done, which is cr- the crowdsourcing model, and this is where you put up a prize – and then people compete for that prize. So you might say, you know, design me a logo. Um, you know, the prize is fifty dollars, or a hundred dollars, or ten dollars, or whatever it may be. And then people from around the world will contribute designs, and it's very interactive. You say, I like this, I don't like this, change the colors, or whatever, and you can converge really rapidly to a, a great outcome. Now, the book I saw recently used the crowdsourcing model, and the book was a cookbook for designing recipes with saffron. And what they said was, um, I want a- anyone from around the world can submit a recipe to me. Um, but you've got to put a nice photo with your submission 
And if I like the recipe and I like the photo and, and I select it for the cookbook, I'll pay you $7. And it literally it was in a, a couple of days that it selected one or 200 different recipes. And basically the content of the cookbook was done. You just didn't have to get a typeset and, and the cover design and so forth, which also is very easy to do on the site. But it, it's just amazing the power of crowdsourcing and, and how you can just really supercharge the business models and supercharge ideas for products. But if you think about creatively, how to, how to kind of build these things. So that's amazing. So then they can just upload. They have like a couple hundred recipes. They can upload that to Amazon. They can get SEO going on Saffron recipes. And bam, they'll probably they'll make their money back and then some. That's right. That's right. So what's what's like the craziest job you've seen outsourced where you were where you said to yourself, I can't believe this was put on freelancer dot com. Well, I mean, the stuff that I'm I'm really 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 excited about right now that that you know, I, I think it's kind of crazy when I look at it. But it's, I guess it's not crazy in the sense of crazy is the stuff that people are getting done in the manufacturing sections. So people are people are coming up with ideas like you know I want to have a lawn sprinkler that connects to Wi-Fi that will connect to Twitter and Facebook and, and, and tweet certain things at certain times of the day as it's watering the, the lawn or watering the, the paddock and, 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 and updating its status to Facebook and so forth. And what's actually happening is there's a lot of factories around the world in places like China that have spare capacity and they've, got, they've all got design teams. And what they'll do is they'll put their design teams onto bidding on these jobs and designing the product for you very, very cheaply. Uh, because they'll say, if you want 5,000 units or 10,000 units by next month, here, here's the price freight on board to San Francisco or, or wherever, wherever it may be. So literally, people are getting products designed with just a spark of an idea. I mean, there was a guy the other day that got a um, – he, he wrote in a little story and said, this is, I had the most amazing experience. He, um, he, had, uh, he was living in a dilapidated mansion. And he said his friends called the Playboy Mansion and he wanted to run a party. And uh, he was in Australia. And um, he wanted to have these giant inflatable swans in the pool for this pool party. The problem is the only place he could find to buy them online was from the US. And because they weigh 3.5 kilos when they're deflated, it was going to be very, very expensive for the freight to, to ship them across. So he uh, thought, well, maybe I can get someone in China to make them for me really cheaply and I can kind of buy a bunch of them and sell some of them online and kind of get my swans cheaply rather than have to pay all these you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars of freight. And so we posted a contest, again, the crowdsourcing model, saying design for me an inflatable pool toy swan. Um, I think he put up a prize of about $400 for that. Uh, these factories from around the world, including China, would bid on it, submitting 3D designs for the inflatable swan. And literally, he ended up buying 5,000 units, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, $5,000 worth of product because that's the minimum order from a factory generally. He paid $16 per unit freight on board delivered to Australia. So I think it was about 400 units off the time he got in his first order. He sells them online at giantswan.com for about $100 each. And um, he's built like this pool toy empire now, just sitting basically at home in his underpants or his pajamas, maybe as, as you are now, um, uh, selling these things online. In fact, he's got a new product now called Giant Flamingo, uh, uh, Giant Flamingo, which is giantflamingo.com, and he'll ship around the world um, these inflatable toys. And um, you know, the box design was, was, I think, a contest that cost about $200 in the crowdsourcing model. Uh, the, the design of the toy itself was about $400, um, he sells it using Shopify, so uh, he did a, a he did a um, a skin for Shopify, which I think is about two hundred and fifty dollars using freelancers. And really, I mean, this is an idea that he financed off the back of a credit card. He com- he said he said he, uh, he had a bit of a complaint recently. He said, um, "Yeah, I used to just go down the post office every day and and drop a few of these off on my scooter, uh, but I'm now doing thirty five um, hundred dollars per day in sales. And I have to take my car down twice uh, with a load full of these products because." Uh, I'm selling so many, so you know. And, could, and could, he, now, could he drop ship from the manufacturer? Well, they do. They've offered to do that now. So that's what, that's exactly what he's done. He's he, and in fact, he's now moved to Bali, and uh, he's just living a life, you know, sitting on the beach somewhere in Bali, uh, selling these pool toys internationally, and it, and it's all been financed just uh, off the back of a credit card. That's that's incredible. Okay, t- tell me another story. Well, you're uh, just you're so, just like an entrepreneur storyteller. <laughs> Oh, look, look, I, 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 I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a pretty amazing story, and this is a, this is a story about um, using freelancers that um, my, my major investor in, in, in the business uh, did many, t- many years ago, and this is kind of how he made a lot of money um, uh, at a very young age. He started a company called uh, PC Tools, um, and they produced a, um, a, a software, an antivirus software uh, program called um, Spyware Doctor, 
And he actually hired some freelancers. This is many years ago. This is about a decade ago. And he paid $1,000 to a team in India who just writes some antivirus software. And he put it on downloads.com and it became the number one download on downloads.com. So this product originally was $1,000. He would sell it online for about uh, $40 per month. The business model was fantastic, actually. What the, the way the business model worked was it, it was a freemium model. I think maybe some of your listeners might, might know that. But it's, it's, but basically, it's, a, it's, it's where you offer a free version of the product, um, which has some functionality in it. But then um, uh, if you want to kind of upgrade and get a premium functionality, you have to pay a, a fee. So what would happen would be you would get a virus in your laptop. You would search Google for free antivirus. You would find um, you know, Spyware Doctor on uh, um, downloads.com. It would be free. You would download it. It would run on your computer for a few hours. It would scan for viruses. It would say, yes, we've found viruses. Would you like me to remove them for you? You would say yes. And it would say, please put your credit card in and pay $49.95 per year. He actually bootstrapped that business to $40 million a year in revenue with no external financing. He paid $1,000 originally for the first software um, to be developed. And the, the, the rest of the business was absolutely bootstrapped from that. He took a little bit of money in. He scaled up to about $100 million in revenue. And he actually sold it to Symantec. Uh, for about three hundred million dollars, and that's kind of how he how he how he originally made his money, and then 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 of course he he invested in us uh, in, in in the in the very very early days, and he's made a significant amount of money money after that. But you know, this was a business that was was basically started with a bunch of freelancers uh, building a software product that cost a thousand dollars. So so you're right now able to see what the what the trends are, whether people are buying, or, uh, you know, at, they're making apps for Facebook, are they making apps for Android, yeah. are they making apps for yeah. iTunes? What kind of trends are you seeing and what, what's kind of surprising you in the trends of what people are outsourcing right now? It's, um, it's, it's pretty time that you asked me that question, actually, because uh, we actually publish a, a quarterly uh, trends report called the Fast 50. And in fact, that's going to be released on Monday um, where we look at, um, you know, and we think it's a very good forward-leading indicator of what products are doing well, what companies are doing well, uh, what technologies are doing well, and, and so forth. You know, we've seen a really big boom in all things 3D uh, recently. So, you know, everything from um, 3D modeling for 3D printing right through to animation, video, etc. Work. Um, what, do you seeing, mean, what do you mean, uh, animation, video? So, you know, people, you know, people are people are you know making videos to show off, you know, show off you know their product, and so they're doing they're doing you know, sort of um, uh, nice little visual. Uh, animations where they're hiring freelancers to kind of do the graphics for them in those videos and doing that quite inexpensively. So, you know, TV commercials and, and, and um, YouTube commercials and things like that, uh, product intros, um, product demo, you know, like on, you go to the FAQ section now on a bunch of sites and instead of having a bunch of text there, you can have little videos to kind of explain how the product works and so forth. So we're seeing, seeing a big boom in that. Um, we, I mean, we've just added the um, the Apple Watch category, so we're seeing seeing. I mean, it's a very low base, but we're seeing a big pickup there. And well, course, what's, an, know, what's an example of app for the Apple Watch? Like, how would I? Let's say I'm going to start trying to be clever with the Apple Watch. What, what direction should I think? Well, I think I think I think I think the starting point for that is really going to be around um, really notifications for the most part. I mean, I actually, I actually haven't got my hands on a watch yet, so I, 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 I I'm only really theorizing here in terms of its use. But from what I see. Or the apps that people are putting together right now, it's really around, um, you know, commu- communicating in some way uh, using the watch in terms of, you know, whether maybe, maybe you've got an existing product, um, which may be a mobile app, but instead of sending the notifications to the phone, now you can send them to the watch so people can get a glimpse of, you know, some stats or some data or a message coming in or an update or, or whatever it may be. I see. I think- so it would be pretty cool, like, for instance, if I have my Google notifications you know, pop up every time my name's mentioned somewhere. I can now have it on my watch. Well, maybe I mean, maybe I mean, on your on your on your blog, you can you can you know, maybe glimpse it. You know, if you're selling if you're selling products from your blog or your subscriptions or, or what, however you monetize it. You know, once in a while, getting you know little updates of kind of how how sales are going, or or um, you know, if, if someone submits a sort of cust- a, a query or sends you a, a message through the blog, you know, getting an update on that. Or traffic stats, or, or alerts. If something goes, if, if the blog goes down, for example, and there's a there's a critical error, you know, streaming in the messages from that. The, the, you know, I, I, I mean, in terms of a category, I think that the category killer um, apps there are, uh, for the watch are going to be around like healthcare and you know the apps for the aged. So you know, if you've got a um, you know, see, there's a lot of I've seen a, I've seen a lot of um, companies uh, or early early stage startups pitch ideas around you know you know um, aged care. So you know, citizens senior citizens tend to suffer from you know, things like you know, falls and so forth. And 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 you know, if there's a way where you can put a watch on their on on, on their arm and, and they can kind of hit a, hit a button and kind of 
um, get someone to respond or get someone to kind of monitor their health or get someone to kind of, you know, assist in, in, in something kind of um, you know, more easily. I think there's a lot of opportunity there, a lot of opportunity in, in sort of personal health care and personal um, yeah, analytics uh, for, for health. Uh, yeah, I think it's a whole new category so, and it's a pretty exciting category. So, um, And, and are, the, are there freelancers yet on the other side of the equation who have the skill set to develop Apple Watch apps? Absolutely. I mean, they've been, designed, they've, been, they've been working on iOS for years, you know, doing obviously Apple um, uh, iPhone and uh, iPad uh, applications. And so it's just a natural extension from that. And so how much does it cost like for me to hire, let's say, a freelancer in the Philippines to make an Apple Watch app? I would, it would be in the hundreds of dollars to low thousands. So wow. depending on functionality. And um, Android versus, uh, you know, uh, iOS. How, how are you, are, is that a trend that you keep track of? Uh, we do track it quarter and quarter and quarter. It's a it's a, it's it's a, it's a constant battle. There's been a bit of an upsurge just recently because um, uh, of obviously the interest because the the, the Apple Watch um, has come out. So there's been a bit of a bit of an upsurge. But I mean, Android is Android's been dominating uh, sort of quarter on quarter. Just in in, the, in the US or around the world? Around the world. I mean, a lot more people have Android phones than they do um, Apple phones. Right. Right. So. So, okay, so basically, if I'm in the U.S., the way I should be thinking is, hmm, what businesses can I start cheaply that can potentially scale up and I could, I could use freelancer.com to hire someone super cheap to make it, whether it's uh, a book writing or a website or an app or an app on top of Facebook or whatever. And if I'm in a developing country, I can certainly make a living. If I have like WordPress skills, programming skills, 3D printing skills, um, have you seen anybody make a living outsourcing 3D printing jewelry or anything like that? Um, I've seen, I've, I've just definitely seen some companies um, that are that are getting going in that space for sure. And 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 it's and um, in fact, actually, I was at Singularity University a little while ago, and there's a company that um, that came out of the graduate program there that was um, looking at 3D printing actual uh, fine jewelry. Um, uh, on the on the platform, I've seen I've seen a few things kind of go through. I think I think we're we're in the in the midst of a, of a big big boom in, in in this whole area. I mean, it's going to revolutionise so many industries. And just like the video, um, like the, the the movie industry and the and the music industry and and so forth, and the book industry uh, had just suffered from massive disruption as distribution became digital. You're going to see this now in the physical goods industry. So there's a lot of companies out there that make manufactured products that are actually quite um, uh, straightforward. If if you if you had a 3D printer, so things like you know, the starting point would be imagine if you're Lego, right? I mean, basically you print plastic blocks uh, and you and you and you sell them. You know, it, it, as yeah, every little kid at some point, I don't know if it's this Christmas or next Christmas, but there's been a hundred ninety nine dollar 3D printer that's been under everyone's kid, every kid's little Christmas tree at some point. You know, the, the, the distribution of, of, of this product is going to go is going to go digital, even though it's a physical product, right? And it's not going to be simple things like um, Airfix models or Lego toys or whatever. It's going to be more complicated and sophisticated things. Things printed in metals and ceramics and nylons, etc. And, and really, it's going to this is the really next big thing that's going to that's going to shake up the world. So I think there's a huge op- number of opportunities here with people who come up with ideas and startups. Uh, taking advantage of, of, of the upcoming revolution in 3D printing. I mean, right now, all I can think of is jewelry, really. Like, if I, if I have a design for jewelry, and then I, I outsource to a 3D printer, maybe through freelancer.com, and then also let them drop ship it for me, and I set up, like, an Etsy store and e- or an eBay store and have the whole thing running outside of my house. Oh, so, I mean, there's plenty of things. I mean, and, I mean, I think Jay Leno gets um, his antique cars, the parts are no longer available, and um, the way that the antique car owners used to kind of um, you know, repair their cars is either you have to customly make the part from scratch or you had to go to um, like these, these meetups or fairs or swap events and try and you know, rummage around in, old, in, in, in parts that people collected looking for, for the bits and pieces. I mean, there's opportunity there and someone making a um, – like the Amazon of parts for cars that are no longer manufactured, right? Um, so – you know, I, I actually um, I actually use freelancers to get a part manufactured for my my car. I, I have a car where the um, the cargo clip broke at the back, uh, which is just holding a cargo net in. And so I, I actually um, I, I bought a three um, a D I had a three D print, and I thought, well, how can I get like a three D um, uh, how, how can I get a, a, a model to actually print out to replace this cargo clip? Because <coughs> like in Australia, it's very expensive to kind of get car parts, so. I actually put a 3D scanner and I scanned in this part and then obviously the, the, the part that scanned in wasn't perfect and I actually hired a friend to go fix the model up 
So they took the model and they kind of they they made it smooth and and, and made, made it you know made it the right size and, and so forth. And I actually printed it out. And I, I used it in my car. I mean, it wasn't perfect because the plastic material at the moment in the, in the, in the Replicator Two X I use is um, I think it was either ABS or PLA and it's kind of brittle. Um, but you know, you give it a year or two, and, and you know, people will be printing all sorts of things at home. I mean, why would you go to the hardware store and buy uh, tools, right? When you can just print them out, and when you're done with them, you can throw them back in the hopper and, and maybe recycle the plastic, right? I mean, there's, there's I mean, when, when they when they send the next, um, uh, when they send the mission to Mars uh, out there, they're not going to send out the astronauts with the toolkit. They're going to send them out with a 3D printer and a bunch of goop, and they're going to go print their tools on demand and then recycle them as they as, right. as they um, you know as they stop using them. So, so what's the what's the largest project you've seen go through freelancer dot com? Like in terms of dollars, well, last time I last time I checked, and it was a little while ago, and this project's ongoing. It was three hundred and forty thousand dollars. It was um, that was a, a freelancer that was hired to do a, a ongoing series of um, templates for a, a library of, of, of um, website designs. Um, but you know, we are seeing some very large projects go through um, you know, on, a, on a regular basis. One that happened uh, last month was the hiring of a naval engineer in Spain to fly to uh, Norway and reverse engineer a boat, and that was a $40,000 project that was um, uh, sourced and hired and, and paid in full through the platform. Wow. Um, who, like, so- was it a company – uh, that needed to reverse engineer this particular boat or like a rich individual or, you know, I, I, I don't have the specifics. This is just, this is just mentioned by that. It was actually, um, uh, one of the support team members kind of just sent me an email about kind of about it. That's, I don't, I don't have the full specifics, but that's, that's kind of like the general general gist of what happens. I mean, we have, we have about 6,000 projects a day go through the site. So <laughs> there's a, there's a huge number of really interesting stories that people, they, they kind of get generated on a daily basis in terms of what people are doing. You know, it's very interesting. Like, as kind of you, you're as you grow, you're going to start to become a slice of the world economy. So there'll be much less reasons for uh, much fewer reasons for uh, large corporations to fill certain jobs when they know they can uh, kind of have a a chief of freelancing who will outsource many of the jobs pr- on a project by project basis. And you think this could potentially contribute to uh, a general decline in income, or in, or perhaps an equalizing of income around the world? I do think certainly over time that the world worldwide labor um, uh, you know, wages are, are going to start to equalize. I mean, you're seeing this already, where you look at countries like China and the, there's rapidly rising wages. Philippines rapidly rising wages. I mean, this is this is all fantastic because the quality of life of someone. Uh, changes just just dramatically um, as they kind of go up that sort of S curve of industrialization. You, you, when you go from making you know you know ten dollars a day or maybe less than that, say so, you know two or three dollars a day, which is you know, you know the poverty line. You know the quality of your life going from two or three dollars a day to ten dollars a day is, is huge in terms of healthcare and education and, and housing and so forth. And going from ten dollars a day to ten dollars an hour. Is is, 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 again, is just, it's just a huge, it has a huge impact on people's lives. So, you know, I, I absolutely do think that worldwide wages will, 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 um, start to, you know, you know, they'll continue to rise in the developing world. Um, you know, obviously the, the challenge in the developed world economies is to, is to really move up the value chain and, and, um, you know, in countries like the US and, and, and the UK and so forth, the big edge that, 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 um, the countries like ours have, is really just the edu- the level of education uh, of the population, and you know ed- education always has been the, the lubricant of you know upwards mobility uh, of a workforce. And I think that I think that the key challenge and the key key thing I think Western economies need to think about is really just to really ensure that the workforce is as educated and flexible as possible. And you know it's a challenge, but the great thing is that that all is all you know, the whole wealth of human knowledge is now accessible through the internet, and you've got these great great sites like Udacity and Coursera where you can learn a new subject pretty much for free or a very low cost, and so the way that education is going to be distributed globally is, is changing. And 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 again, that's all heading to an online marketplace model as well, where you know the traditional bricks and mortar institutions of your know, colleges and universities are going to struggle in a world where you can go and get a Harvard or Stanford or whatever lecture online for free to teach you just about anything you want to learn. Why do you think? Why do you think so many companies still require that degree, given that? Um a, getting the degree might not still might not provide the skills necessary for a job, but many of the skills can be acquired now for, like you say, for free or for low cost. 
Yeah, well, you know, for now it is it is a pedigree getting a, a bachelor's degree. Um, but I, I tell you, a, 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 an interesting thing that happened a, a little while ago, and we hired an engineer from Poland uh, to work full time here in the office here in Sydney. And he had just come across the country, and he submitted his transcript. And his transcript, he he'd had a master's in robotics uh, or mechatronics from a Polish university, but he also listed. Uh, the five Coursera courses that he had done um, and the marks he had got for those courses. And actually, my, the team leaders of engineering that were interviewing him, actually, it was interesting to watch, they were more excited about the courses that he'd done on Coursera than they were about the degree because they said, oh, I've heard about that course. That course is fantastic. That's got this, this, this guy's teaching, it, et cetera. How is that? And they spent, they spent the entire time talking about the course he had done online rather than, than the actual um, – the actual uh, degree had done, the two God, degrees had done. Gosh, I hope my uh, I hope my kids listen to this podcast because I really don't want them to go to college. And <laughs> I take courses on Coursera, and they're brilliant compared to what I experienced in college. Well, I mean, just like on freelance, you can architect your career with Coursera. You can architect your education, right? So instead of having a uh, you know four year bachelor's style degree where you go through a, a rigid you know structure of progression you can really just architect the education you want right so you know maybe yeah i mean the, 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 yeah I, I've, I've done a number of degrees and one of the things that's always frustrating when you're doing a degree at university is you want to enroll in the course that's over in the other faculty and they won't let you because you know it's the wrong course code or it's the wrong faculty or we won't get credit for it etc and, and and the great thing about online learning now is that 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 you, you can do that. You can just kind of pick a bunch of courses and kind of you know, architect that path. And not just that, but the sophistication that's going to come in with online education, it's going to allow you to learn a lot quicker because you can personalize the learn and add the learning experience based upon your progression, right? So you know, as you go through these checkpoints, you do questions and so forth. The software is going to know. What you where are you doing well, or, we'll, we'll, you know, so we'll let, kind of let you kind of we'll, you know let you progress at a certain pace through that, and where you're struggling, and and, and it's going to come back and it's going to provide sort of reinforced learning around you know the areas that you're not so good at, and maybe it'll understand that you know the reason why you're struggling in a certain areas because you don't have the foundations from a, you know from from some other you know, other areas underneath it, and it's, it's going to it's going to educate you on that. Well, I wonder. I wonder if um, even freelancer. dot com could become a, a platform for that kind of education. So, let's say I need to learn a certain set of uh, skills about WordPress and integrating with a shopping cart. Um, I want to outsource somebody to to teach me those skills. Um, you, you know, potentially you could be like a tutoring platform. Yeah, I, I, it's funny you mentioned that because I've got um, I've got several dozen of the young engineers here that are really passionate about doing exactly that. In fact, we we, we run a a hackathon every quarter internally where people come up with their own ideas and kind of work in teams for 48 hours to kind of deliver them. And, you know, uh, very often um, a bunch of the teams here work on things around education. Now, we have we, we do very little at this point in time. We, we, we do certify skill sets. You could do little uh, multiple choice exams on the site in, in various areas and kind of get a badge to, you know, to prove that you, you have some knowledge in a particular area. These are pretty basic certifications at this point. But, you know, I, I certainly do think that an educational offering and, and uh, of course, yeah, with 15 million users, we could populate that educational offering with a whole bunch of content from the freelancers who are skilled in all sorts of technical areas and, and, and niches and so forth. So it is an exciting thing for the future. We are, we're, not, we're not doing it right now, but, like, but, it, but it is something that a bunch of guys here internally are really passionate about thinking about in the future. The other thing is um, kind of creating a, a sort of consulting platform. I don't know if you've seen – you've probably seen uh, Clarity.fm where I could uh, – post my skill sets and then say how many dollars per minute I charge and then people arrange calls with me and, you know, people can do consulting via that. Yeah, yeah. So so I think I, I think that's I think that's an area that sort of LinkedIn's gonna go into um, in a big way. So um, I think that, you know, if you want your five hundred dollar per hour taxation advice, I think at some point in the future you'll be able to be able to go to like a LinkedIn profile and click on someone and get your you know pay per pay per hour or pay per per pay per fifty minutes, etc. Um you know, it, again, I'm looking, there's so many different ways you can get work done, right? You, you get work done. There's online uh, project-based work, outsourcing work. There's crowds, ways of doing crowdsourcing. You've got ways in which you can pay per action. There's, you know, there's local jobs. There's online jobs. There's whatever. There's, you know, there's contract jobs. There's so many different ways people can work, which is which is really exciting. And, you know, over time, we're going to build our offerings in all sorts of different areas. And so so what was there kind of like a critical point where you were like uh, – Oh my gosh, this is a great idea, and I'm doing nothing with my life at this point. So I better start this and, and get going. Like, how did you 
sort of get into this? Uh, it's, it, it's kind of an interesting story. Um, so, my, my, I mean, my background is I, I, I did computer science and engineering. I went to Stanford in 97, 98. It was quite fortuitous in terms of the time. I did a master's in electrical engineering um, uh, there. So did, did you know that. Larry Page and Sergey Brin there? I, I, I saw them around. I took pity on their website because it was it was Google dot um, uh, Stanford dot edu, and I thought, okay, I'll just use their I'll use their um, <laughs> their search engine uh, because they, because they were kind of like the underdog at the time. I didn't I didn't really know them um, uh-huh. uh, in my class. However, I, did, I mean, did a t- technology entrepreneurship class was one of the guys who founded um, PayPal, uh, Ken Howry. Uh-huh. So you know, you, you're right in the middle of the whole the whole thing. Um, it's it's kind of funny. It, if I knew kind of now what I knew back then, <laughs> uh, it would be pretty amazing. But, um, uh, you know, it was, it was a pretty exciting time. There was, it was just so much innovation going on. And, and even even while you knew, you, you'd see all these little startups kind of on campus and kind of at the time you thought, well, that's kind of interesting. Is it going to take off, et cetera? And then, you know, 10 years later, these are you know, very, very, very large companies. It, it's it was a pretty special. It's a pretty special place. It was a pretty special time. Well, to be fair, but, um, also, what, what's your, your company is public on the Australian Stock Exchange. What's the what's the yeah. market capitalization of your company? About half a billion. Half a billion. So it's 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 not like you're a small company either. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting there. We're getting there. Um, yeah. So I mean, the, I mean, the history the history behind how, how I started it was um, I, I actually came back to Australia and I started it. I worked briefly in venture capital, but then I started a semiconductor business. We're building some integrated circuits and, um, you, you know, I ran it for six years and it's one of these things where you, you've got great technology, you've got great team. It's just that the, the, it's just way too early for market. We were building gigabit chips uh, to scan network traffic in a, in a world where there were no gigabit networks in the early 2000s. Uh, today, that technology runs at 180 gigabit per second. I mean, like, okay. it's just, you know, it's, it's just, you know, there's a, there's, you know and, and, the, and the way we sold it was all kind of wrong. But, you know, that company ends up selling to Intel, um, which is great. Um now, uh, I, so I left that company in 2006, in December, 2007, 2008. I was kind of looking for something to do. I was working on a few little side projects, and one of the side projects I was working on was um, just uh, helping someone with a, with a website. Were, were, you, were you a little depressed at this point? Like you had just spent all these years building this semiconductor company, and now you're just working on people's websites? Uh, I was actually crushed, uh, emotionally and physically crushed, because... Um, the business didn't actually sell to Intel until 2013. So I left in about 2006. It was, you know, I was doing a, a couple of million a year in revenue at the time. I hadn't set the world on fire. I'd spent six years, you know, you know, heart and soul, sort of, you know, really, really trying to, 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 you know, I was probably too much in love with the product and um, not really thinking about it as enough as a business. You know, we were selling this OEM into network equipment manufacturers. So, you know, it was a very technical sale, which was we were comfortable with. It's VP engineering to VP engineering at McAfee or LG or, or wherever it may be. But, you know, it, you had a, to, to design a chip into it, someone else's product. I mean, the product it might have an annual product cycle. You've got a two-year then potentially sales cycle to sell the product in. And then, and then you've got to design it in, which maybe takes up to 18 months, and then and they'll ship a product. And, and because it's hardware, they're not going to put you in all the products. They'll put you in maybe a small product line. And, you know, it just takes forever to kind of – it just it – just, the business model was all wrong. We should, have, we should have made our own boxes and sold the boxes directly in, a, in an enterprise sales model. But, you know, we were inexperienced in sales and we were a bit scared about that. So we kind of went down a different business model route. So there's a whole bunch of different failures there. But anyway, you know, I was pretty crushed because I walked out of a business that, you know, it just taken so long to kind of get going. And, you know, I, I just – you know, it's it's just, it was just it's it's very very tough to be an entrepreneur, but um, especially when most companies don't don't succeed or kind of limp along for a while. Right. And I was I was kind of looking for something to do. I was really just keep you know keeping myself sort of entertained a little bit, uh, helping helping someone uh, a few people build, build some websites, and you know I had to get some data entry done. So I had to fill in a spreadsheet with the name name of a bunch of businesses, the email address, the phone number, the URL, etc. And you know, I thought maybe I need to get about a hundred, a, a thousand of these um, in the spreadsheet. Uh, it's really boring work. You know, the way the way you've got to do that is you've got to Google search for these businesses and then enter in the contact details. I thought, you know, someone's little brother or sister would love to do this job. I'll pay them maybe two dollars per row um, to fill in the details. It's about a thousand rows. I'll pay them about two thousand dollars. Surely, there's some, someone will love this job. And you know, it just took. You know, I spent four months trying to find someone who would do this job, and I, it was just impossible. I'll define people, but I'd work for half an hour. They'll tell me it's really boring. I said, yes, I know it's really boring. I'm paying you $2,000, right? Uh, you know, I've got soccer practice. I've got exams. And, and then eventually, I, after four months, I just got really, really frustrated. 
and I posted, I, I did a Google search, I think I'd search for cheap data entry online or something like that, and I found this website called Get a Freelancer. And I looked at the site, and I wasn't quite sure what to make of it. It looked like Craigslist. It was the ugliest website I think I've ever seen. It was just all these grays and whatever. It was just looked, looked terrible. And, but it had all this activity on it. I wasn't quite sure what was going on. It seems like people were getting jobs done there, etc. So I posted a job, and I kind of forgot about it. I walked away, and three hours later, I came and looked at my email, and I had 74 emails in my inbox saying I'll do it for $2,000, $1,500, $300, $100. Wow. I thought to myself, no, no way. I, I've spent four months trying to get someone to do a job, and there are 74 people willing to do the job. It, it's, I just, it's just unbelievable. And, and, and for $100, I'm, I'm willing to pay $2,000. I couldn't find someone to do it for $2,000. Now they're willing to do it for $100. I thought, this is ridiculous. This, is, this, can't, be, this can't be right. So I hired a team. They were in Vietnam. The job was done in three days. It was perfect. And I didn't have to pay until the job was done. And I just thought to myself, Wow. This is the real sort of eureka moment. This is when the light bulb was going off my head. And I just thought, this really solves a problem for me. You know, and, I, you know, I mean, every great business needs to have a problem that's being solved, right? So did you, and, did you never experience this wow with your old business? Like that kind of like excite, excited sort of feeling where, oh, my no, God, there's demand no, for this? I, th- I, think I, I think in my other business I had a really active imagination. I kind of thought, well, wow. This technology could do this and could do that, etc. But it, it, it was really just a—it was the grind. It was you know you'd go and you'd meet network equipment manufacturers, you'd pitch the product, they'd kind of be half interested. You'd say we'd do a demo, etc. It, it wasn't this moment where it was like, "Wow, I can now hire an army with a credit card to right. do anything." Right? And here I am, an entrepreneur, slightly crushed from my last business, right? Slightly demoralized, not really wanting to kind of go. To, you know, it's after six years of just really just. I was, you know, f- flying trans-Pacific flights, you know, once a month for six years, and just physically tired. I thought, wow, I can now start a business with maybe no employees, sit at home in my pajamas, and just hire people so cheaply to do the things I can't do, right? Like graphic, I, you know, I can des- I can program, but I can't do graphic design. So, I, I, you know, it's amazing. And I thought to myself, wow, and I was just thinking to myself, I, I could just build so many businesses just off the back of a credit card. And then I thought to myself, hang on a tick, this is kind of like an eBay for jobs. I thought, surely this is like a massive opportunity here. I thought, you know, you have global marketplaces for products. Surely global marketplace for services is kind of an obvious category that no one really had thought about at that point in time, really. And I thought, why hasn't eBay done it? Right? I thought, I thought, and so I, I thought, I need to get into this space. I thought, this is amazing. So I started a website called biddedout.com and I hired freelancers off Getter Freelancers to copy Getter Freelancers. So, you know, I would do programming, they'll do the graphic design and this, that, the other. And after a few weeks, I got a basic little prototype up and running and I kind of figured out the model. I thought, okay, well, uh, let's do a little rudimentary financial model. How much money do I need to raise to kind of get this going? Maybe I can just raise about $4 million to get it going. Uh, so, oh, gee, you know, that's going to that's gonna take a while. And I did a bit of survey of the space and there were, there were hundreds of little companies trying to do this. Um, but none of them really had any traction. There was about 12 that had some traction, but no one really had set the world on fire at that point. And I thought to myself, wow, no one's going to really finance me to be the number 13. And um, so maybe I need to try, try and really buy rather than build and see if I can kind of buy one of these sites to kind of get a bit of a head start. So I asked about six or so of them, are you interested in potentially selling to me? And about three or four of them said, yeah, I'm interested in selling. For cash or for equity, were they going to sell? Uh, cash. Mm-hmm. I, had no, I had no equity to offer them at that point. I was just a guy at home in his pajamas, right? So I said, um, I said, well, okay, well, how much, how much do you want? And ironically, the one I liked the most was the one I used first, which is Get a Free Answer. And the reason why I liked it is because it had more traffic than any other website in the world uh, in this space. And the reason why... I found it was because they dominated in search engine optimization, SEO. So when I typed in cheap data entry, they ranked number one. Okay. And, and that's why they had so much traffic. It's just the, the site was ugly. It was, it was badly put together. I mean, the guy who run it did a fantastic job getting it where, 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 where it got to. Had about half a million users. Uh, had a huge amount of traffic. It just, it just it, you know, it, it just was badly monetized. And well, so, why, why did they want to sell rather than, they, they must have saw, seen the growth potential here. 
Well, the, problem, the, the issue is the whole industry only really got going around 2008, 2009. And the reason why is because before 2008, 2009, there was no real internet in the developing world. So the primary driver of this business is wage arbitrage, right? And the fact that you, know, you can get a website built for $100 that will cost you $1,000 somewhere else in, in the US, right? Mm-hmm. And before that, I mean, the, back in 1999, if you think about this industry, the value proposition was – um, that website that's going to cost you $10,000 from the local web designer, you can get it done through a website where it will cost you $10,000 as well. But back in 1999, the internet was kind of slow. Uh, there was no Dropbox. You couldn't really share files easily. You couldn't upload them. You had, you had to meet the designer down a cafe at some point and give them the, the CD-ROM or here to give you the CD-ROM, the files back, etc. So it was kind of a bit of an inconvenience going through a website to get these things done. It, it, I mean, the, the speed of the internet wasn't there. The tools weren't there and so on. But over the years, the you know, internet got better and better. The tools got better and better. They, you know, software, you know, it started eating the world and headed into the cloud and all that sort of stuff. And but around 2007, 2008, 2009, a few things happened. It was a kind of a confluence of events. Number one, the internet hit the developing world. So for the first time in the Philippines or Indonesia or India and so forth, you could maybe get a home internet connection um, and so on. And so the developing world were going was going online. So you had five billion people were connecting to the internet over, you know. At the moment, we're, 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 about, we're about 3 billion, we have 5 billion people who earn under $10 a day who want to go online. And, and when, you know, the minute they hear about one of their friends making a month's salary in a few hours or a few days, all of a sudden it's just, wow, how, how can I get on the internet, right? Like this is, this is amazing. And it's a really powerful motivator to get connected and, 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 and skill up and, 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 and learn and, and, and get in there. So you had like this you know, this huge labor force that was coming online. At the same time, you had the global financial crisis in the US. So small businesses were looking for new things, looking for new ways of doing things. Instead of hiring that full-time designer or whatever, maybe I can find a cheaper way of doing things. So I was searching the internet. You had a lot of people in the US out of work. And they weren't so much going online and freelancing, although some were. But they suddenly had a lot of time on their hands. So, you know, that website I've always promised to build or help build for my wife or, or for my, you know, my my grandmother or for a cafe or, or whatever it is, you know, I've got some spare time now. I'll help them out, right? And all that side project, you know, I've always wanted to kind of figure out if I could get a little app, app build or whatever it may be. Uh, you know, I've got some spare time now to kind of go, go get that done, right? And so you had, had demand suddenly coming and looking for new ways of doing things. You had supply coming online in a big way. The software tools were getting there. You had you know, communication, voice of IP, things like that now that you could actually communicate and so on. And so the industry only really just started around that time. So, so all these guys who started back in 1999, 2000, 2004, they've been running their business for a long time. Like, so Get a France has started in 2004. By 2009, it spent five years just trying to get the business growing, and it was growing. It was just that it was just five years of hard, hard, hard work, being a little bit too early for the market. And you know, at that point in time, I said to him, "How much money do you want?" He told me the price. I thought, "Wow, that's actually less money than than, than I was going to raise to start a business from scratch." So I might as well try and buy this business. Can, can I ask? How, can I ask how much money? I mean, it's probably public. yeah, it's, it's public now because we're a public company, so all yeah. this stuff gets disclosed in disclosure documents. It was three and a half million dollars. So. So and it was doing about a million dollars a year in revenue. Wow. So, so you know, I thought, wow, it's, you know, that first, you know, any entrepreneur would know this. That first million dollars in revenue is the hardest million dollars you'll ever make in your entire life. It is just that first million is just so tough. Once you've got a million dollars in revenue, it's kind of like an optimization uh, operations research problem, right? You kind of you can pull a few levers over here. You know, you can, you can statistically test that, they be testing and so on. Was that better or was that worse? If it's better, let's keep doing that. If it's worse, let's do it, let's revert, let's do something else. And so, it, you know, that once you get out of that hump of the first million in revenue, which is what this site had done for me, then you're away, right? And I knew I, I, there was a lot of problems with the site and ha- how it worked, the business model, et cetera. And, you know, the, you know basically, I said, great, let, let's do it. I got, so I got, so you, uh, knew, you knew, like you were able to say to potential investors, hey, they're doing a million in revenue, but I know with a few tweaks I can get this up to like five million in revenue. Yeah, I, 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 I did. Now, the, the unfortunate thing is the, none of the investors would actually would understand it, right? I mean, most venture cap, early stage venture capital investors expect four guys in a room with PowerPoint and no revenue. And I hear I was saying, well, I want to I buy this site. And um, it's doing a million a year in revenue, and it's been running for whatever years, and you know, and it's run by a guy living on a fish farm in Vanuatu, a Swedish guy. And they're like, "What?" And they look at the site; it looked terribly. 
what what is this? A, a Swedish guy living on a fish farm in Vanuatu? This side looks. What, what is, this is they wouldn't understand it. Or the ones that would understand it go. This is kind of like a management buy-in. So a management buy-in. I'll give you five percent of the company to kind of you know whatever. And it was just, it was and it was very very tough. Um, but I found uh, there's a guy I knew. Uh, Simon Clausen, who um, had started PC Tools, that story I told you about before about right. the antivirus software, and he got it straight away because I mean he had started his original business, like like you, you mentioned your website and how you got that done so cheaply and you'd sold it, right? I mean he'd done the same thing, right? So he he built a software business using freelancers, and he thought straight away he just got it, right? So uh, he gave me the money uh, and I bought the business, and then and then I kind of you know, went there and I fixed up all the the bugs that I kind of saw in the site, and I got the graphics up to date, and, and you know, every time I improved something, the revenue went up and. I could use that revenue to hire more people. And that, I mean, that's all I do in this business is I look for incremental revenue opportunities. And, and as I make a dollar more, I hire another person. So so and, what, what was the biggest change you made early on to kind of like, uh, quote unquote, growth hack, hack the business a little higher? Uh, well, I mean, there's several things. Um, the, the business model originally was 10% commission being uh, levied to the freelancers. So the, the employees post the jobs. Um, uh, that cost it originally was five dollars, uh, which was refunded to you if you if you pick someone, and then the freelancer had to pay a ten percent commission. Um, but if you uh, were on a membership, a gold membership, that commission was zero. Ah, so and that's so, great. And so seventy six percent of the turnover of the business was at zero, and so I I, I changed it from zero to three percent, and the revenue really picked up. I and mean, the other problem was the affiliate program paid out a hundred percent. Of revenue, and so those gold memberships at twelve dollars a month, they'll be paid out at one hundred percent. So, I mean, the business was seeing them had all that economic activity, but it just wasn't um, making any money. And the other thing was the graphics were just so terrible. I mean, it looked like Craigslist, and and I just fresh. I had a friend of mine who was a designer in New York. I said, "Listen, can you kind of come up with a template for me or a skin?" And and I I actually did original um, programming to kind of put that skin on the site, and that doubled revenue. Like it was just wow. amazing. It just double. It just went from a. So I want to buy Craigslist because I want to reskin their website. <laughs> it's funny the connection between design and revenues, actually. Well, the amazing thing about being a designer is today is that the designers really have the opportunity to move right up the value chain, right? So the difference between Airbnb and a billion dollar business and, and, and an Airbnb that goes nowhere is down to design. It's down to user experience, but understanding behavioral economics. Understanding conversion optimization and 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 so forth and behavioral psychology and let me tell you if you're a designer today you it, it, designers are the hardest job function that I that for me to hire you know I can hire engineers that's tough that's in tough supply data scientists are remarkably easy to hire I don't I don't know why I would have thought they were really hard but they're they're, they're actually fairly straightforward. Uh, I guess because if you're a physicist, the, the opportunity is either you want to work at a, at, a, you know, at CERN or whatever and, and, and not be paid very much or, or, or work in finance. And then, uh, you know, if you want to get to tech, it's a huge opportunity for data scientists. But designers, you know, it's the toughest role to hire um, to get really good designers. And if you're really, really good at what you do, you're the guy that's, or girl that's going to turn a business into a multi-billion dollar business if you just get it right. Because a lot, a lot of the thing with with distribution being online now of a product and service, so you distribute through a website or an app or whatever. If that app is great, it looks great, it's got the delight in there, and you've really thought about the you know, how the user, how that app makes that user a better version of themselves. Then that is the key, and if you, you can translate that into the design, that is the key thing that will make or break a business in tech. That's that's really interesting. Well. Uh, this has been such a fascinating conversation, Matt. Like, I'm really jealous, actually. I didn't go out there and buy Ghetto Freelance myself, uh, at the time. Like, you, you were there at the, at, in the right place at the right time. And, and you're right. Like, I had the sense, too, this is a great idea, except I was using it to build businesses rather than buying the business itself. So you were very <laughs> smart. Yeah. I mean, in, in anything, it's, it's timing and luck. You know, and and and, and I guess no. Yeah. I mean, you you had the insight. You had that wow feeling that oh yeah. my gosh, this is real demand because I'm feeling yeah. the demand. Yeah, I mean, you gotta have you, you gotta have initiative, right? And I and I guess you know it was a combination of things. I, if I if I was six months earlier, it would it would have probably not have not have worked. And if I was six months later, you know, they would have all been financed by venture capitalists or, or bought, and and it would have all would have gone. I was lucky I went in there early. And then the other thing I did was I um 
I bought all the competitors. So, you know, when I, when I got going and I made a bit of money, every time I, I made a dollar, I, I basically hired someone that was smarter than me to help build the business. And then when I got enough cash uh, to buy the competitors, I started with the small guys and worked my way up. So we bought um, uh, 16, I think, marketplaces now, I think at the top of my head. Um, yes, so, uh, Scriptlance was the company I used uh, in 2006. Yeah. Yeah, script lands, get a freelancer, rent a coder, v worker, uh, freelancer to coder, UK, uh, Denanza, you, know, you name it. So, you know, uh, that was another pretty successful strategy to kind of go there and you know, buy out all the competitors before anyone else could. And then, and then you went public and now you're still growing. Yeah, so we went public in November of 2013. It was actually a pretty, uh, pretty exciting day because, um, you know, we went public on the Australian Securities Exchange. And for those of you who don't know this about the Australian stock market, it's the fourth biggest equity capital market in the world. It's the same size as NASDAQ. It's just that it's all in resources and, and mining for the most part, but it's done a phenomenally well in financing the resources industry. If you go and start an early stage mining company, you don't go to Coal Hill Road and knock on doors and beg for a preferred a complicated preferred stock structure from a venture capitalist. You just go write a prospectus. And you crowdsource the financing um, uh, through the stock exchange, right? And you go on, you, you, you write a prospectus, you issue it to the market, and people fund it, right? It's a bit like Kickstarter for, for grown-ups, right? Oh, funny. Um, and, you know, I had written profu- pro- prolifically uh, beforehand saying that the future for the technology industry in Australia is crowdsource finance through the Australian Security Exchange. We've done it for resources. We can do it in for tech. We've got some, for very similar um, risk-reward profiles, and the venture capital industry in Australia is dead and will never never come back. So for a bunch of reasons. So so you know we we thought okay well, let's give it a go. We we bootstrapped the business uh, from the original uh, fundraising from Simon th- for five years, and then we we wrote a prospectus and we and we listed on the uh, we, the issue price was fifty cents. The stock opened at two dollars fifty. Wow. Uh, it was the third biggest opening ever on the Australian Securities Exchange. It actually opened at one point one billion market cap. Uh, I was kind of looking for the share price. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was kind of like that week you had um, Twitter was Twitter was IPOing, so they had their bird out the front of the, the stock exchange in New York. We had our bird out the front of the ASX in Neon. Um, they had all the press there and so forth. It's about Justin Bieber mode for about five minutes. They said ring the, ring the bell uh, hard because the last person that rang the bell was a little Japanese man who didn't really make a noise. So I rang the bell. The bell broke. The oh, ASX no. Claim this is what new technology does to old technology. I was trying to look for the share price. You know, with the issue price is fifty cents. I'm looking for something, you know, eighty cents or whatever it may be. I see this two dot five zero. I go, what's that? That's the share price. So it was it was a pretty phenomenal moment uh, for, for for a little while. But um, you know, um, you know that worked out really well for us. Um, the business is growing strongly. We've got a great team. We've got about four hundred staff now around the world. Uh, Fifteen million people on the site. Seven point five million projects. If you haven't given it a go, I encourage you to give it a go. It's free to post a project now. We got rid of that five dollar fee. That was another little growth hack that got the business, uh, you know, uh, booming uh, by by lowering the cost uh, for for the demand side to, to transact. And um, it's just incredible. I just just you, you know, people, investment banks. Every time I go and talk to an investment bank or a financial fund manager that's now a shareholder in the business, you know, they they tell me the next time I meet with them, they've, they've got their financial models now developed on freelancer or that. Or they're using freelancers to scrape the content off the sites that of, of the businesses that, they, that they're investors in, so they can track the performance of them. So they scrape the listings off companies like Seek to know how many job listings per day there are, or car sales, or whatever it may be. Uh, people are getting you know, you know, financial models developed. I mean, every every year, it's just the sophistication and complexity of the jobs just goes up and up and up, and it, it's just a it's a phenomenal business to run. I, I think the real exciting thing for for potential listeners here is to come up with. Essentially, ideas for businesses you can start cheap by using freelancer.com, businesses or books or any sort of project. So I, I, I'm a user, so I, I'm a big fan. I mean, I would. Lo- I mean, if any of the, any of the listeners out there uh, has got any ideas and, and, and po- have posted or are about to post a job and get good results, I'd love to hear uh, how, 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 the, how the results were and love to hear about all sorts of the crazy things you've done on the site. I mean, my email address is just Matt, M-A-T-T. At France.com, I'm happy to receive emails from anyone. Uh, but you know, it's always exciting to kind of talk to people and see all the you know, wild, wonderful, and crazy things they do on the site. Well, Matt, thanks so much. Uh, I know it's like I don't know if it's, is it the middle of the night or the middle of the morning in Australia. Yeah, it's it's uh, almost midnight, midnight on a Friday night, so it might be time for a beer or two. Yeah. Well, <laughs> good luck, and I, thanks so much for taking the time. And um, I hope people use the site and and good luck. Likewise, thank you very much. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, Matt. Bye. Me too. Okay. 
For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network at stansberryradio.com. And get yourself on the free insiders list today. Powered by Snapdragon, the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra elevates your photography to epic new heights. Snapdragon processors deliver a color experience like no other with sharp, industry-leading 8K video capture. You can also snap images in 200 megapixels, capturing more detail than ever. And those late-night blurry pics are a thing of the past thanks to next-level night mode. Experience powerfully moving premium photography only with Snapdragon. Follow us on Instagram at Snapdragon Official.